I'm here to talk about Trees of Music and Rain and the work that we've been doing together with David Harbour. So that is a conductor in, well he's a cello player as well, in a nursery in Brazil and he's playing his cello with, well he's not playing it obviously, that's a, the branch of a Pernambuco tree which is a very special tree that we're going to be hearing about today. But let's begin with how can beauty damage the environment? So that's a interesting question, isn't it? Let me introduce Pau Brasilia Echinata. Uh, it's also called Pernambuco and it's also called Brazil wood. And that is the tree that Brazil is named after. In the same way that the Ivory Coast is named after ivory, Brazil is named after Brazil wood. And this tree, um, the word braza in Portuguese means glowing hot coals. And it is a beautiful red color and it produces this beautiful red dye. And that's what the Portuguese were after when they first went to Brazil or the land they then called Brazil. And they extracted this tree by the millions to make dye. And then in the 1740s, it was discovered that it was uniquely resonant. And um, an achetier, a bow maker, started to make violin bows that could be concave rather than convex. So if any of you are familiar with the Mongolian violin, for example, which makes a kind of screechy sound, that's what violins used to sound like before Brazil wood was used to make violin bows. And it's uniquely resonant and it's uniquely flexible and strong as well. You can't get the same sound out of any other tree. You can get something similar out of carbon fibers. But this very, very special quality of this, of the beauty of this tree has led to its near extinction. And it's looking at potentially going extinct in the next 15 or 20 years, this tree, which is the national tree of Brazil and also an important part of the ecosystem. So that's how beauty can damage the environment. Beauty can damage the environment very easily. I went to Ashtown Forest recently and I went to the original Poustix Bridge and I wanted to play poo sticks, but you, you can't find any sticks there. So I had to like go wandering quite far to go and get sticks. But then what I did was I uh, got into my boxer shorts, I jumped in the, in the river and I pulled out all the sticks that these kids had been throwing into the, uh, into, the, into the river. It was clogged up with sticks. So that's what happens when we get really, when we find something very beautiful, then we can end up damaging it. So there's a question, how can beauty damage the environment? How can beauty regenerate the environment? That's what I want to talk about today. So um, here's a very easy way that David Harbour has been helping with us. They have been giving us money. And with that money, we've been doing a whole load of projects, one of which is Trees of Music. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. We're going to come back to this question in a minute. This is Trees of Music. Uh, Trees of Music is a project to grow from seed Pernambuco trees and then to plant them in areas that used to be the Atlantic Forest. Now, the Atlantic Forest is about 95% deforested at this point in history. Uh, most of it is in Minas Gerais, which was the area of Brazil, um, kind of central Brazil. It's the size of France, and it used to be a big forest until they discovered uh, Minas mines there. And 90% uh, of the gold on the international market was coming out of there for 160 years. Uh, they discovered diamonds, they discovered everything. Um, half a million Portuguese, half a million slaves came to the land and it got de extremely deforested. So, uh, what did we do? We produced 50,000 seedlings working with prisoners on day release who were tending the uh, saplings, also reskilling. And we worked with the Federal University of Espírito Santo, which is this, uh, this state along the, along the uh, Atlantic coast there. Um, the biome of the Panabuco tree is the Atlantic forest, which is not quite as famous as the Amazon. Uh, so we worked with various different marginalized communities. In fact, Rain's projects are all involving marginalized communities. We work with indigenous groups, we work with black women's groups, we work with uh, formerly enslaved people and uh, or enslaved populations. And one of the reasons we work with marginalized groups is because the groups that have managed to survive all of these years uh, under the difficulties of the colonial period have powers of resilience and cultures of resilience and understanding of ecosystems 
which are very useful to us. Um, we've been hearing today about the decline of uh, species and what we can do to uh, revive them, to bring them back. So that knowledge is embedded in these communities in Brazil. So as you're going to hear later on in the talk, we do schools twinning projects as well. We do a whole load of projects. I'm going to talk about just one of them mainly today. But the schools twinning projects involves uh, making partnerships between UK schools and Brazilian indigenous schools and then introducing indigenous land management practices into the UK curriculum with 36 lesson plans that we've linked up to the UK curriculum. So anyway, this is the Guarani uh, indigenous nation. So they planted some var trees. And uh, these are some kids from the favela. Favela is the Brazilian slums. This was a really beautiful project. This was right near, uh, quite near the university itself. And there's a video of these kids shouting on the hillside, Marcia plantou an árvore! Marcia planted a tree! And there's someone over there who would shout, João planted a tree! Screaming on the hillside, it was amazing. Um, and we also worked with state municipalities as well. These are two of them. So we were working with agroforesters like this guy in Mukui City. Agroforestry is a way of planting crops and trees together and it's super good for biodiversity, also for food security. There's a reason that people are deforesting their land it's because they need to eat. So agroforestry is a way of hitting both of those uh, targets. And also working along the bank of the uh, Benevente River. Right from the beginning of rain, we've been working in, on hydrology. Uh, because rivers are the most important parts of the environment for a bunch of reasons. So how can beauty regenerate the environment? We already talked about how, um, for example, this wonderful company is celebrating its anniversary, have these beautiful sculptures, and when they sell one, they send some cash to us. So that's really good. They also put on, um, this was at the Chelsea Flower Show, Priya Mitchell, um, performing for Trees of Music. And we have concerts as well, which are raising money for Tweezy Music, that was one uh, just outside of Bristol. Um, but I want to kind of interrogate that question a little bit deeper. We've got tons of ambassadors, you might recognize uh, a few of those there. But yeah, I want to interrogate that question a little bit deeper. What is beauty? Any ideas what beauty is? <laughs> so we heard a lot about beauty today, I wonder what it is. This is what Pythagoras thought. He said it's the objective principle in beings which maintains harmony, order, balance, and proportion. He was into his maths. So we're gonna come back to that idea of, um, of beauty, balance, and proportion. And I think something has happened. Uh, Andy. Telly's gone off. Um, so, well, anyway, you can look at me. Um, the beginning of the story happens in a place called Chapada do Norte. It's in the north of Minas Gerais. It's a super deforested area in Brazil. And uh, I went there for the first time to introduce myself to the parents of the woman who was pregnant who I was with. And um, that's mother of my children. Uh, and her brothers, um, her parents were very uh, welcoming to me, which was good and her brothers took me swimming in a very, very beautiful stream and it had dandelions, dandelions? Uh, dragonflies buzzing around and fish nibbling at my belly, must have been the whitest belly they've ever seen. And it was absolutely fantastic. And then five years later, we went back to show off the babies, they were twins, and they weren't babies anymore. And the river had dried up, so I couldn't go swimming in there anymore. And all of the rivers in this area are drying up in the north of Brazil, the Rio San Francisco is diminishing by the year, you can see it um, as it happens. So that's what it looks like now, and this was horrifying to me, so I thought, well, what can I do about this? I can, oh uh, dear, give me a second. Um, <laughs> that's all right, it's good. Um, so what can I do? Uh, we, I spoke to the mayor of the next door town. The next door town was called Cachoeira, which means waterfall or rapids. And uh, I'm going to turn that off. Yeah. Um, Cachoeira means rapids, but the rapids had dried up in the 1920s and his dream was to see them flowing again. So we started working with local schools. Um, 
Oh, I forgot to say. Okay, why, 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 are the, why are the streams going away? Because of massive deforestation in the area, which is disrupting the water cycle, also causing loss of soil, loss of biodiversity, loss of livelihoods as well, because people live from the land, and, and loss of carbon sinks. That was my um, uh, mother-in-law's land there with the, you can see the erosion there that's happening on it because of the deforestation. So what, we started working, building sapling nurseries with schools in the area. Uh, that's two different schools there. And that went really well. And then we started regenerating springs. So that basically means when you have uh, deforested land, the runoff uh, silts up the springs. So kind of scooping the goo out and then protecting the springs from being... Um, um, silted up again and what happens after that is they start to flow a little bit better and they flow even better in fact there were five dried up springs around this town of Cachoeira um, so we started off by cleaning them up and then reforesting the area around them so when it rains it holds more moisture and it can start to bring back the springs bring the springs back to life so there are some videos on our website about the impacts of those reforestation drives in that one in particular the guy as he's taking the video he hears a bird they haven't heard for a number of years which is really exciting uh, and so we did a, a few um, sapling nurseries and a few uh, spring restorations and then we did this um, this is also a uh, sapling nursery this is in Recife which is a big urban center uh, in the northeast of Brazil and that was going pretty well and then the pandemic hit and so that whole project kind of went in a different direction, started working with um, food security basically, because people were uh, starving in the towns, particularly in the favelas in the slums. So that got me thinking about networks. In fact, I was already thinking about networks, but um, you know, you can do a spring restoration here, you can do a beach clean up there, you can reduce your carbon footprint, uh, you can you know, cycle to work, you can do all these various different things and we're all doing a little bit here and there, but it is my belief that this isn't actually going to work. And the reason is because we have a whole load of problems, we have a raft of problems, we have uh, ecological problems, we have climate problems, we have lots of unhappy kids with psychological problems, we've got political problems, we've got economic problems, and the root of all these problems is the same thing. And I believe that that is disconnection. And I believe that the answer to that, solution to that, is connecting. So, I became interested in networks. And uh, that was the project that we did with the Black Women's Group uh, in Hesifi when people started getting hungry there. So we were working with the university there, setting up a uh, demonstration center in, a, uh, in this um, Black Women's Group, um, the, the kind of house they had in the favela, uh, teaching them how to collect water off your roof uh, with plastic bottles, um, how to do irrigation out of that, how to do agroforestry on a very small scale, how to make cosmetics, how to make medicine, how to make compost, all these kind of um, scalable projects on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a small on a small scale. And the result of that was that um, we produced some beautiful media, we spread it through our networks, that raised more money, and then that project spread from one favela into nine favelas, so these techniques can can spread. We work with small projects directed by our communities that can then spread. So here's the question that I wanted to ask. Could the collective intelligence of a distributed network respond to the challenges we fail to meet as individuals? Because our challenges are very large, right? What can I do about melting ice caps? Uh, don't know, it seems rather too large for me. Could the collective intelligence of a distribu distributed network respond to challenges we fail to meet as individuals? So I started looking into nature, particularly into slime moulds to begin with. Now slime moulds are single-celled uh, amoeba and they are extremely beautiful, I think, in their way. Um, when they are under environmental threat, when it starts to dry out on their log where they live, they come together into these mushroom-like structures and then they spore. And the, they're not actually spores because they're not, fun, uh, not fungi. 
but they are they're protists. But then these spores manage to get onto the air currents, sometimes even onto the wings of insects, and they can be taken somewhere else and they can survive. So this is an example of collectivizing in order to survive for collective resilience. And I thought that was very beautiful and um, something we can learn from. These guys also respond to a changing environment. What can a single amoeba do about its environment drying up? Not very much, but look what they can do when they get together. What can a human do about its environment drying up? Not very much, but what can we do if we get together? I could talk about slime molds all day. I love slime molds. If anyone wants to talk to me about slime molds later, I will tell you one thing. They also predict rhythms in time. If you blast a slime mold with cold air, it will retreat. And if you wait an hour and you blast it again with cold air, it will retreat again, but more. And if you wait an hour, five minutes before you blast it, it's already retreating. Right, so they can already start to predict rhythms in time. These guys know how to farm. If they find a bacteria they eat, they can eat. They will take some of it, they'll take it, they'll eat some of it, and they'll cultivate some more of it so they can eat it later. Amazing. They even know how to learn how to teach each other. For example, if you have a slime mold, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I can't not talk about slime molds, they're too exciting. Um, uh, if you have a slime mold and uh, it needs to cross a salt bridge to get to food, right? they don't like crossing salt because they dry out, but um, they will learn that you can cross a salt bridge to get to food, and then if you put them next to a colony which doesn't know that yet, then they'll cross it much quicker. But then if you put them with the colony, they'll teach their mates how to cross a salt bridge to get to food. And these are like single-celled creatures without any brains or nervous system, right? So if they can do that, we can do something similar, surely. Someone was talking about mycorrhizae earlier. Uh, so that was, oh, there you are, brilliant. Thank you for bringing it up. So um, I want to talk briefly about mycorrhizae, which are the mycelial connections between trees under the ground, which, um, uh, which trade resources between trees, which trade information between trees. Um, and the ground is thick, especially in old growth forest, is thick with um, miles and miles. In every teaspoon, someone mentioned all the microorganisms in every teaspoon of soil. There's also miles of hyphal filaments in every teaspoon uh, as well. So, um, yeah, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, networks, mapping space, redistributing resources, responding to the changing environment working together in harmony and communicating information. Wouldn't it be good if humans could do that? And what's that got to do with beauty? And what's that got to do with art? It's all for collective resilience. So uh, regarding communicating information, and this we're getting back into beauty, if an insect attacks a tree, let's say it's a Douglas fir, then that fur will produce defense chemicals that make it unpalatable to that insect or poisonous to that insect. But it doesn't only do that, it also produces infochemicals which pass through the mycorrhizal root network to tell the other trees in the area, oi, there's an insect in the area. It will it'll say specifically what insect it is so it produces the right defense chemical. That's pretty cool. That means that when that initial uh, insect has stopped feeding because it can't feed there anymore, it goes to another tree, but it finds that it's already defended because it takes a few, a few days for this um, reaction to kick in. That means that the insect doesn't become a pest, it doesn't become a plague, right? Uh, it's a method of biocontrol, keeps things under control. But a Douglas fir will also communicate with a spruce, communicates with different species as well, which is pretty amazing. So learning from infochemicals, what do infochemicals do? They spread widely, they communicate with other species, they provoke an appropriate response. These are the images I grew up with when I was learning about deforestation. And um, this is terrifying, right? Uh, pictures of the Amazon burning. I don't want to see that. I certainly don't want to spread that widely. I would rather spread a meme about something stupid than an image of the Amazon burning. Um, this doesn't make me want to, if you think about species, right? How do we communicate with other species or other people rather? Um, well, I can't even send that kind of image to my mum, let alone to someone from my, I don't know, my chess club or my uh, orchestra. So what can we learn from income chemicals there? And to also to provoke an appropriate response. This doesn't make me want to do anything. This makes me want to go to bed and cry. Uh, these kind of scenes, like terrifying images, I don't know if you remember the... Um, the uh, Don't Die of Ignorance AIDS campaign, right? That was completely unsuccessful. You can't terrify people into changing behavior. You can change behavior by 
by working properly with their brains, there's another network to work with. Right? This produces cortisol in your brain, and cortisol makes you want to do, do patterned actions, do the things you did before, which is why it's so difficult to break addictions when you're in a bad place. But if you can produce dopamine, and these kind of neurochemicals, dopamine opens up new possibilities, new ways of thinking, new ways of breaking patterns. So communications that produce uh, the wrong chemicals, the wrong response, are entirely inappropriate. So, what's that got to do with us? Well, with the help of David Harbour and uh, our Trees of Music campaign, we uh, produced a whole bunch of media. We worked with a whole bunch of different um, musicians uh, this was a, an interview by Matthew Barley that got on Radio 3. This one over here, which was Trees of Music, this was uh, two Brazilian songs um, arranged for uh, strings that got on Classic FM. That one over here, that's Brazilian TV, and it's like the equivalent of the Murdoch TV in Brazil, so they managed to get on, on their channel. This was Annika, who went out from the UK to go and teach uh, violin as part of the Trees of Music project in a favela, that same favela project that were planting Pernambuco trees, produced by prisoners, planted by favela dwellers who uh, were also learning violin. And this final one there, Noro Sai Monote, um, which was a song that was sung by the leader of the Noki Koi, right? I'm gonna try and play this for you at the end, uh, if it works. It's a, a video that was, um, it's, it's a song that tells the story of the rubber boom in, in, in uh, indigenous land, which is basically a story of ethnic cleansing. Um, and this, they have a traditional song about it. It's absolutely lovely. And uh, we got it arranged for strings by um, Misha Mullavabado, who's a, a fantastic musician, and uh, played in a beautiful church, St. John the Evangelist. We had images of monkeys leaping from tree to tree and Amazonian scenes on the walls. And then we got a voiceover by Miriam Margulies. So I'm hopefully gonna be able to play that to you at the end. Uh, why did we do this? Because we want to communicate widely, like the infochemicals, because we want to communicate to different species, different types of people who aren't ecologists. Musicians don't tend to be that interested in invertebrates they've never heard of going extinct, but they are interested in violins and they are interested in music and to provoke an appropriate response. And it has been evoking, evoking a, or provoking an appropriate response. And in fact, this, this, this idea of communicating across boundaries, across borders, has uh, kind of expanded even further now. Um, that one in the top left is um, from the American Association of Woodturners, right? A couple of weeks ago, I went out to the USA. I got invited by this woman, um, Nalini uh, Nadkani, she's called. She's an epiphyte specialist. She works up in the canopies in Costa Rican rainforests. She heard about trees and music. And she said, well, that's amazing. You're communicating to musicians. What I want to do is communicate to wood turners. So that's what she did. And I went out, I turned my first whisk handle. Um, I was, it was 120, uh, 1,200 wood turners at the conference. And there's 16,000 wood turners in the American Association of Wood Turners. And we're trying to make them into ambassadors for ecology. So that is on our blog. That is a fantastic talk that she gave. This guy over here, he just ran 252 kilometers across, that, across the desert on the Marathon de Saab, and he gave us um, half of the cash that he raised for that as well. Um, so it does seem to be that we're getting into various different places. Working together in harmony and redistributing resources. Can I have a time check? How long have I been talking? Do you know? Oh, got ages, okay. I'm definitely going to be able to fiddle with the machine in a, um, in a bit. Um, where's Andy? Jackie, you, you can fiddle with the box and maybe do the thing. Thank you. Um, so redistributing resources, this is good for everybody, right? Um, the way charities are normally set up is you have beneficiaries and benefactors, right? Uh, and it's rather colonial in its thinking, I think. Yeah. The mycorrhizal root network doesn't work like that. Um, protests and mycelia are kind of anarchic in their hierarchies, right? Who is benefiting in a relationship between a... Um, what we need is a, uh, an iPhone, uh, a plug in it. Uh, sorry about that. That's going to keep 
Well, I'll tell you what, let's turn it off for now and we'll do it on the end. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, what was I talking about? So, redistributing uh, resources. Yeah. For example, there are indigenous groups that have been cultivating trees for, this is one group, the Kain Gang, for example. They've been cultivating a tree, it's called the, uh, the Parana Pine, for about a thousand years. It's a pine, it produces pine nuts. Naturally, and at the time of the dinosaurs, when the dinosaurs were eating it, and ever since, because it's a really old tree, it produces pine nuts for one month a year. But the Kayang Gang have been cultivating it over a thousand years to make 17 different strains that produce pine nuts at different times of the year. So over nine months of the year, they now have pine nuts being produced, which means they're attracting biodiversity for nine months of the year, which is very good for their hunting. But we were hearing before about keystone species for regeneration. This makes it a fantastic species for regeneration because you can plant these things when they produce nuts, they're attracting birds for nine months of the year and those birds have got all the seeds from the other things that they're eating all over those nine months and they crap them out and those seeds grow into trees. So it's a really, really good way of using indigenous knowledge to do restoration or regeneration. And there are all kinds of techniques that the indigenous world has uh, cultivated and kept for restoration. So we think, when you think about who's the benefactor and who's the beneficiary in a relation to like this, we're losing our topsoil, right? We're losing our biodiversity. They know how to keep it, they know how to restore it, right? So I think this, um, this division between beneficiary and benefactor is a, uh, an illusion and it's something that's not very helpful and it's much more beautiful for us to communicate as partners so we've got our partners over here with David Harbour and we've got our partners in Brazil with these indigenous communities and black communities and all the rest. Redistributing resources, uh, it does um, good stuff in the formerly colonized countries that we're working with, or particularly Brazil, but it's also very good for the businesses because, well, what do you know? 92% of consumers favor socially responsible businesses. Um, investors, uh, efforts to improve both society and the environment contribute to as much as 73% of investors' decisions. So when investors are deciding whether to invest in a business, they, that, they take it into account. Um, regarding the workforce, CSR-focused companies see a 35% increase in employee retention over a five-year period. That means if you've got workers and you're doing CSR, you don't lose the workers so easily. They're also, I mean, millennials are willing to work for lower pay for um, companies that have good CSR projects. So this is a win-win situation, just like any healthy network, everyone benefits. So our partners, you know, we're sending them money, our partners are producing trees, which is good, but they're also producing media, sending them back to us. So uh, companies that work with us can then share it on their networks and they can um, make, uh, you know, it makes their consumers happy, it makes their investors happy. Um, I just want to tell you very briefly about four, well, wh where Trees and Music is going. We're working with the Patasho Indigenous Nation, um, planting trees on their traditional land. Uh, Brazilwood trees again, they live in the uh, Atlantic Forest or formerly Atlantic Forest. One pound plants a tree, 5,000 pounds can restore an entire hectare. You will have maybe seen the footage or the news about um, carbon credits being rubbish. Am I saying anything controversial here? No, I don't think I am. Um, the gold standard scheme of uh, regis registration scheme, or um, that's not the right word. Um, the gold standard scheme of carbon credits is called VERA, and uh, accreditation, that's the word. And there was a study done, and they found that 90% of their projects are doing nothing or making things worse. The best uh, carbon sequestration and biodiversity projects are run by indigenous people. This has been studied and it's absolutely the case. So these are good people to work with. They're very hard people to work with. This is not easy, right? They have been treated very badly by people who look like me for the last three, four hundred years. And there's a lot of post-colonial trauma there. And if I'm working with, uh, I don't know, uh, these guys are pretty cool actually. They've been very, very... Um, uh, uh, not so demanding with us. But if we're working with a software company that wants something done on Thursday, and we're working with an indigenous group which has a different sense of time, um, then that relationship can be quite difficult to organize. So that's what we do as RAIN. We are the network which can facilitate communication, cooperation, uh, mutual aid between 
uh, communities separated by distance, by culture, by post-colonial trauma, and all the rest. So that's where the Brazilwood project is going. This is the Re Regen Network, working with uh, schools and uh, bioregional hubs in the UK. So if there's something going on in your area, uh, and maybe that may be a connection to a school, connection to a conservation project, connection to a business that wants to get involved to support its local school, but also support something going on in Brazil, this is the project for you. What else have we got going on? We've got a mangrove project uh, in the transition zone between the Amazon and the sea. So that's a beautiful project. This is, this is um, basically the Brazilian space program in Alcantara displaced a whole load of people when they built the launch pad. And the result of that was these people got put into a mangrove swamp. They had nothing to do to make any money, so they turned it into charcoal. And uh, we're replanting that um, swamp. There are um, thousands of hectares there. Uh, we've got our initial plans to plant a million trees and 50, 50 hectares. Again, it's about a, it's about a pound a tree. Uh, and this one is also with a Quilombo community. I didn't say what Quilombo community is. So briefly, when slavery was abolished in the 18, in 1890 in Brazil, the slaves who were released were often discharged without any compensation. So those people, and also people who had escaped during slavery, made their own communities in Brazil, and often mixing their culture with indigenous culture. And they have extreme powers of, of, of resilience that have managed to survive all these hundreds of years in this very, very difficult situation. So they have imported traditions from West Africa and also local indigenous traditions. They know how to manage their environment. They know how to live off their environment. They know about the medicine. They know about the food. And they have their own cultural traditions. So the, both of these projects are working with quilombos. It's a completely untapped network in Brazil in the sense of NGOs because they don't like working with NGOs generally. But we've got some really good relationships with them, um, both of these groups. Uh, the Kalunga is a... Um, is, uh, it's a very large quilombo area um, and it's had a lot of illegal uh, land grabs, which is very common in Brazil. A lot of their traditional land has been turned into uh, pasture and soy fields. Uh, sometimes you'll, in Brazil you might see a sea of soy all around you, or you might see eucalyptus all around you, and they have these little uh, islands of biodiversity, often around quilombos, which are maintaining their traditional culture and uh, land management.